Pressures are forcing business owners to look for avenues to assess and free up cash flow. One such option has been in the form of a sale and leaseback transaction. It's an enduring strategy that causes minimal disruption. Subletting and sale and leaseback transactions are two of the most popular ways to free up cash flow tied up in commercial real estate. Joining us now to explain the advantage of these options is John Jack, CEO of Galetti Corporate Real Estate. John, thank you so much for your time. A pleasure speaking to you again. Now, unpack what exactly is entailed in a sale and leaseback transaction, particularly in the commercial space for us. Yeah, I mean, a, a sale and leaseback transaction is essentially where the business owner sells the property that they own and occupy to an investor who then leases it back to them. But, you know, when you came on, you said we were going to explain the advantages. There, there are the advantages and disadvantages of the sale and leaseback. So I think it's important to get it right when you enter into a transaction like that. Now, why is it important to think long term rather than a short term approach in such transactions? particularly looking at the advantages of this transaction? So the, the leases are typically long-term in nature. So the, the best price you're going to get for your asset is when you sign a long-term lease and then sell it on the back of that long-term lease. So these transactions happen at exactly the same time. The lease is signed at exactly the same time that you sell the asset. And when you're entering into a long-term lease, you've got to very, you've got to very carefully think about what happens ahead because – as you know, you sign a 10-year lease, you escalate this lease year after year, and in the ninth, 10th year, you're in a situation where you could be paying a lot. So it's important to try and model your cash flows going ahead as closely to your business expansion as, as possible so you don't land yourself up in a situation where, you, where you're effectively overpaying on rental. And this is a common uh, sort of pitfall of um, a sale and leaseback transaction where the business owner often tries to get as much as possible today in exchange for overpaying in the future. And, that, and that's, a, that's one of the bigger issues when, when looking at a sale and lease back for a business owner. Now, you've explained the financial model, so to speak, of it. So a uh, bakery owner sitting at home wants to free up some cash flow, as an example. So they would sell their bakery and then lease out that same ba bakery to the new owner. Is that exactly what it is and what it entails? So let's say the bakery in your example, they would own the building that they that they occupy and that they are yeah, they run their bakery from. They own the actual building. What they then do is they sell it to an investor. That's the actual building, and they lease the building back from the investor to continue the operation of their own business. So their business stays in the same place, but their asset moves from their own balance sheet to the new owner's balance sheet and they become the lessee instead of the owner of the building at that time per se. I would imagine that given COVID-19 and this time that we are finding ourselves um, financially and economically in South Africa, so to speak, it sounds like a very um, lucrative way to go. So how long can we expect sale and leaseback trends to continue well after COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, they, they're definitely going to be around for the next few years. Um, and, and largely, it's, it's about looking at what you can do to restructure your balance sheet. Often, you've got business owners who've owned properties for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. In some circumstances, they've even owned them for the last 100 years. And it's, it's about this asset sitting there. It's ungeared. Uh, they're looking for ways to release capital in their business. And this is one of the ways to do it at a relatively sort of cheap a relatively cheap option of getting that capital release from their balance sheet. You know, it, it, it is something to be considered though, because, you know, over the, over the long term, again, you are releasing an asset and just, you can't do it too expensively for yourself. You don't want to, you don't want to end up paying too much in your lease um, where you've just kind of released this asset because you're under pressure. You want to get it right. You want to, you want to get the best value for your building and you want to get the best value for yourself on a, on a long term lease. So they need to be now, can this process go pear-shaped, and how does one protect themselves from losing money in a shady deal, as an example? Yeah. It, it's gone, we've seen it go pear-shaped. It, it a lot of the times it goes pear-shaped. And, and, you know, typically, the, and, and this is where investors are wary of sale and leasebacks, often a sale and leaseback, when it's not structured properly, where it's not considered properly, is a business owner going, I need money, let's just do anything to get hold of it, and, and I'm willing to pay a rental which is way above what a typical market rental would be in order to release the maximum cash for myself now. 
So an investor will often go and look at the actual financial statements of the business to see that there's no significant trading pressure. They'll, in some circumstances, ask them to make sure that they retain the cash or that no dividends are issued out of the business. So the cash is retained for the business to strengthen the actual underlying business that's in operation. Um, and, and where that business owner has just opted to get the most money out of their building as possible and sign the highest lease, often three, four years in, a business that was under pressure now gets under significant pressure despite the fact that they've unlocked some capital in the business. And that's, that's really where people run into problems with selling these packs. So you, need a, you need a good balance. So this is obviously in the commercial space. What about the housing or the private space? What are you seeing there in terms of trends and how people are relieving themselves from economic pressure? There you're going to see a sale, um, and and people are downscaling their their actual, you know, their their home potentially. You might be in a in a higher value home, and you sell it and maybe purchase a lower value home, thereby releasing some cash for yourself. Or alternatively, you might you know move to lease somewhere else. But people are typically downscaling in that situation. The difference with commercial is you're actually selling and then continue to operate from the same premises. Whereas in residential, you're probably selling and moving to a smaller premises. That also might be the case, by the way, for a, for a, for a commercial transaction where someone sells their operations and just moves and finds a, finds a smaller space. We see that in the, in the office market quite a lot, specifically now where people are looking to try and optimize their, their office footprint. They might say, well, you know, we do see ourselves using an office into the future, but we might not use it the same way as we've been using it historically. So people might say, well, let's not be as panicked about getting our entire workforce into the office. Let's make sure that people, you know, come to the office, interact, engage, build a culture, take the business forward. And so there's definitely space for office, but people are just going to move it, use it differently. So therefore, your 1,000 square meter office, you might only need 800 square meters, 700 square meters going forward. And, and that's where you actually find people selling their, their space and moving to a smaller space. And, and as much as a 1,000 square meter users is, is moving to 800 square meter, so a 1,500 square meter users moving to 1,000 square meters. So there's lots of transactions and, and sort of staging down in the market. And the other, on the other hand, there are also people getting bigger and bigger. It depends on what sector you're in. Now, uh, John, because people are so cash-strapped, can they actually do this alone without um, getting a professional service you know, to, to assist them um, with these uh, transactions? Obviously, being very mindful of some shady dealings that, that may transpire or you getting yourself locked down into a long-term business deal that doesn't actually serve you. Look, you can. It's just, it's just, it's the underlying transaction simple. You sell your property and you lease it back from the new owner. So the fundamental transaction simple. You can put it together by yourself. What you're not doing in that situation is establishing some form of sensitivity analysis. What happens if we sign a five-year lease? What happens if we sign a seven-year lease or a ten-year lease? Could we attract more value for our property? And what's the what's the best sort of um, where, where does the rubber meet the road here? You know, what's the best value we're going to get for the sh- shortest possible lease and and at the same time let's make sure that we've benchmarked ourselves back to market and we're not paying a significant rental that we you know uh, that we wouldn't be able to achieve a better rental anywhere else at the same time um, are we using the bus- the, the property functionally or, or do we have is it too big for us are we just leasing it back because you know see the tree hit the tree type of mentality so all of those things are, are ticked off when you when you work with a professional, or, and and that's across the board. You could be working with a legal team. You could be working with a corporate real estate advisory, such as ourselves. You could be working with your accountants. There there are a lot of people who understand these structures, and I think at the different levels add different values. And um and 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 so yes, you can do it by yourself. Um, should you do it by yourself? Uh, it's probably not the best idea. And the other, the last thing is, of course, you want to cast a wide net in terms of investor and make sure that you get the best price for your building as possible because you, you know, you only get one shot at this transaction. So you want to do it right the first time. Gotcha. Thank you so much, um, John, for that analysis and your time. That was John Jack, the CEO of Galetti Corporate Real Estate, just basically unpacking the details that are entailed.